As a preliminary matter, I am Brian Colloran, Chair of the Newberry Conservation Commission. Permit me to confirm that all members are present and can hear me. Uh, Conservation Commission members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ben Yehagen. Yes. Dan Streeter. Yes. Frank Wettenkamp. Still muted, Frank. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Peter Pecos. Yes. And Samantha Holt. Yes. All right. Good afternoon. This November 12th, 2021 open meeting of the Newberry Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely consistent with the act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, which extends the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law until April 1st, 2022. This order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location and allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded and the attendees are participating by video and or telephone conference and the recording will be available on the Newberry Access YouTube channel. So, before we turn to the topic of the agenda, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. Regarding public comment, there will be no opportunity for public comment or questions at any point of this meeting. The public comment period was closed during our last meeting for this project. The public is, however, welcome to listen. Accordingly, all attendees, except commission members and staff, will remain muted during this meeting. However, please remain aware that video participants can see you and that anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Uh, finally, the vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So, that's that. Um, all right, so then on to the meat of the day. Um, Sam, did we get an agenda to actually read? Do we, I mean, we know what this is, right? I don't need to stick to the agenda, do I? Um, well, this is the only thing on the agenda. So I think, I think you should be all set. Um, yeah. If you wanna, if you have a copy of that um, thing that you usually read when you open up the hearing stuff, that like notice of intent to construct blurb yeah you just read that out for the for the record yeah that's what i'm looking for i wasn't ready with that one um uh, all right give me a hot second Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm allowed to read it, but I have it up. You can screen share it, and then I can just read it off. I can step in and read it too, as well. If you want, Brian, I have it up. Uh, yeah, throw it on the screen. I, I mean, or read it yourself. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, like, think it's you can... I can just read it in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go, go for ahead, it. Then. Okay. Um, Cricket Lane LLC 55 Pearson Drive, DEP number 050-1355, a continued NOI to construct 24 single family homes with 800 feet of roadway, common septic system, water lines, sewer lines, and stormwater management system. Roadway includes limited crossing, wetland filling, and replacement with work in the buffer zone. And this hearing was closed on November the 2nd. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. No problem. All right. So then. As you all know and just heard the business for today, DEP number 050 1355, 55 Pearson Drive. I believe the meeting dates we discussed this were the meetings of June 1st, June 22nd, August 3rd, September 7th, and November 2nd, and the meetings in between were when the topic was continued with no discussion. So today we need to decide if the project presented by the applicant adequately protects the interests of the Commonwealth Wetland Protection Act and if the performance standards set out in that document have been met. If we believe the project has met the performance standards, then we may condition the approval of their project in such a manner to ensure that the interests and standards of the WPA are upheld over the course of construction. If on the other hand, we feel that the performance standards within the WPA are not being met, or we feel that the interests of the act are not being met, then we have grounds for denying the project. Currently, 
in my opinion, I do not feel that the interests of the act are being protected, nor do I feel that the performance standards of the WPA are being observed. I'm concerned about Title V and stormwater questions near the D and VP series wetlands, uh, and I'm concerned about buffer zone impacts adjacent to the A, D, and VP series wetlands. I'm going to give each of you a chance to state your feelings on whether or not we can condition this project. And I'm going to ask you to refrain from including the reasoning for the moment, uh, though if there are any topics beyond what I just said, uh, I'd like to hear them. Um, I'm going to go through the individual uh, points uh, one by one, uh, at which point we can all sort of go into our reasoning. Uh, but right now, I just want to hear your sort of broad view on the matter and if there are any topics um, you'd like to make sure that we cover. So, um, Ben, go ahead. Um, I would say that I agree with you and that I feel that the uh, interests and performance standards are not being met by the project as it's been presented by the applicant. Um, I think that I broadly agree with your main reasons you outlined. And I would add that uh, there are, I think that there are questions that we asked that were never answered as well. So there's also a lack of information component. I don't know if you mentioned that or not, but if you didn't, I would add that in. Okay, uh, Daniel. Um, <clears throat> I think I have been, as we've gone through this, the hearings, I've been sort of trying to come up with ways to condition the project. And I, I just want to say, I think it's unfortunate. I think we could have done more in that, headed in that direction, but the uh, applicant choosing to close the hearing um, kind of makes it difficult to, to, uh, to actually craft any um, conditions. Right. Okay. Um, Pete? Yep, I would agree with the previous statements of the other commissioners. Okay. Thank you. So then uh, I'm going to move into the point in detail just to make sure they're all on the record. Uh, as we move through each item of concern, um, I'm just going to lay it out as I see it, and then I'll turn it to you guys as I just did, and you can add or subtract or uh, comment as needed. I'm going to begin with the concerns over the work within the D and the VP series wetland buffer, which is sort of up in the uh, the top corner closest to the um, the state's WMA. Um, so regarding the BVW that contains certified vernal pool, again, the D and VP series wetland, uh, currently the septic system is flush with the 100 foot setback to the vernal pool uh, as required by Title V. Or sorry, Title V requires a 100 foot setback. We've got an outstanding question regarding whether the earthwork associated with the septic system is included in that setback, since it is a required aspect of the engineering. The setback is required by the Title V process to protect the interests of the act. The applicants have also stated that they will not redesign this feature in response to an observation Dan offered uh, on the September 7th meeting when he referred back to comments that agent Doug Packer had made. Uh, and the refusal to redesign was reaffirmed in the November 2nd meeting in response to a question of Frank's, which Ben repeated, because uh, Frank had a poor connection at that point, uh, until we as the commission assure that the applicant has interpreted the Title V setback accurately, which we cannot do since the applicant has requested we close the information gathering portion of the review process. Uh, I feel we must assume it's out compliance, and there's no way for the commission to condition the construction of the system in such a way as to bring it into compliance with the standards set out by the WPA and the Title V process, which means that I, as, as I currently understand it, I can't reconcile those things with the interests of the act. Uh, similarly, uh, the stormwater management, um, the stormwater BMPs that are explicitly forbidden by the WPA uh, include placement within 100 feet of a vernal pool of a swale. Uh, the applicant's representative stated their regret for their use of that word, swale, uh, on the November 2nd meeting, um, but they apparently chose to convey stormwater from one location to another uh, in a manner that's explicitly disallowed by the WPA in the location that placed it. Um, furthermore, the arrows that show the stormwater flow on their plans uh, aren't explicitly addressed on any of the plan pages, which just leaves more questions. And just as with the septic system in my Title V uh, concern, 
there may be a perfectly reasonable explanation for those arrows that meet the performance standards for stormwater and WPA, but we're currently unable to answer that question. So I'm left to assume that the proposed work does not abide by the rules, regs, performance standards, and the act. So um, that's my primary concern. Um, sorry, not primary, first concern, the first concern we're going to do. So then, anything to add or subtract or color that one in a little? Yeah, um, I, I agree with everything that you've said there. Um, I tried to if I can I'll give me half a second to if I can pull up the exact way. Oh no, I'm making my life more difficult because I just closed the window that I meant to open. Um yeah, I, I think that the only place I would say anything further is is uh regarding I've I've been searching for answers uh regarding the grading associated with the septic system. The first thing you mentioned there. And I, I'm with you where logically um i feel like if it's engineered grading associated to an engineered septic system you know like the grading is part of the engineering if they were if this were to come in anything the engineer would say no this grading is part of the function of the septic system and you need to have grading like this in order for it to function then it's part of the system and it's and it would be not in compliance with the title five wpa things uh, with the policy documents and everything else because it's part of the septic and it's within 100 feet. Um, so uh, I think that I found some language um, within 10.03 uh, that, that specified that work within the footprint of the system would likely mean that associated grading is included. So I, I'm, I think that it, ultimately it is probably an answer that somebody who's an expert in this and interpreting this at DEP will have to come up with. but my interpretation, and again, not being able to get further information at this point, is that the I have issues with the grading of the septic system within the 100 foot setback from the CVP. So I think that's the only other, just going, tying it to the WPA. I just wanted to put that in. That's some of my justification okay. for that. Okay. Um, Daniel, any thoughts on this particular issue? Uh, no additional. Thoughts. Okay. And Pete? Yeah, I don't have anything additional to add. So similar concerns, thanks. Okay. So then let's move on to the next item uh, that concerns me. Uh, so within the non jurisdictional A series isolated wetlands is a jurisdictional isolated land subject to flooding, which it's a resource area. According to the WPA, when an uh, ILSF, an isolated land subject to flooding, contains a vernal pool, an ILSF contributes to the protection of wildlife habitat, according to the Act. Uh, that this ILSF contains a vernal pool is shown by the order of resource area delineation uh, on the property, the ORAD, uh, that was uh, done prior to this project submittal. Um, the language in the WPA, at, uh, specifically 10.572A5, uh, regarding vernal pools and ILSF states that the pool must be certified, but it also states that the presumption is rebuttable about requiring a certified pool. As the ORAD controls the boundaries of resource areas on the project on the site and what they contain, whether or not the vernal pool could, would, or should be certified, it's functionally a non-issue for our purposes at the moment. We're bound by the ORAD to treat the ILSF as contributing to the protection of wildlife habitat. The applicants have been in the possession of this document since prior to their submission of the notice of intent. The vernal pool noted in the ORAD was omitted from the plans they submitted to the commission. And so in addition to not abiding by the terms of the ORAD, this means that the applicant submitted a notice of intent, which was factually incomplete from the beginning. So for these reasons, I don't think that the interests of the act are being protected, uh, nor are the performance standards being observed in the sense that uh, a permit that was written and granted for this property was not carried over fully to the next submission. Um, you know, so that that's one another thing that bothers me. So um, on that point, uh, Benjamin. Yeah, I, I, I 
agree with your interpretation and what you're saying. Um, and then I, I think that I'm further, again, it gets to the information aspect of it where uh, Ms. Martin in the previous meeting talked about how this was a complicated area with the ORAD and certification and everything. So um, I, I think that it, at the end of the day, the interests of the act are one of the interests is to protect wildlife habitat and vernal, and that's what's going on here. So uh, I agree with what you said. And I just, you know, as Ms. Martin said, the her advice would have been to treat this resource area cautiously and conservatively and, and provide buffer zones and protections for it, which currently I don't see on the plan. So that would just be my additional color there. Okay, uh, Daniel? Uh, nothing new to add on the topic. Okay, uh, Pete? Uh, <clears throat> nothing new to add, but I do have significant concerns about this point. Okay, um, all right, so then the next item on my itemized list. Um, so as a commission, we're bound by the Wetlands Protection Act to protect the interests of the act in buffer zones and several sections of the WPA are therefore relevant to how we regulate activity within the buffer zone of both the ILSF's VP and the BVW's VP, the vernal pool for the isolated land subject to flooding and the bordering vegetative wetlands. The sections of, of the WPA uh, that I'm looking at specifically, uh, section 10.03 1A3 at the very top, which uh, ensures that work within the buffer zone will contribute to the protection of the interests identified in the act. 10.53, uh, section one has language that says, the issuing authority shall impose conditions to protect the interests of the act identified for the adjacent resource area. And uh, in 10.52, it says that we need to impose such conditions on a proposed project as to ensure that the project is designed and completed in a manner consistent with the performance standards of the act and the, the, the protection of um, values. Um, so the amount of clearing in these buffer zones proposed by the applicant, which for long sections of the ILSF and BBW go right up to and flush with the flagging, they, that's inconsistent with protection, protecting wildlife habitat that's identified as being provided by the resource area that they you know, are cutting the buffer down for. So as it stands, I don't think, I, I think it's inconsistent with the act to approve the buffer zone as currently proposed because it does not contribute to the protection of wildlife habitat. So um, on that point, uh, Benjamin. Flip it around and start with Pete. I've been doing all the talking. All right, we'll turn it around. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. Um, I actually don't have anything, any uh, any comment on this at all. Okay. You're too easy, Pete. Too easy. Uh, Daniel? Um, I, you know, and I agree with the, uh, you know, what you presented. Um, I think in particular, I think it's the C series wetland on the southeast side, if I got it right, um, you know, the grading goes right to the wetland, basically, in many locations. And uh, there's a significant change of slope from what's there now. Um, I mean, there's going to be a lot of sheet flow going to the into that wetland. And I think that it would have been better to start off with the limit of work, limit of grading some distance away so that uh, any of those uh, impacts would be reduced. Yep. Okay. Uh, so then Benjamin? Yeah, I completely agree with what you said and what Dan has just said. And I'd probably add in that um, very recently, we looked back, um, we ran into this issue on Boston Road and, uh, and we, kind of set us, I feel like we just set up a line there about how much buffer we wanted to see around resources, resource areas like this. And 
the buffer is being provided in this application don't meet that. So I, don't, I would just add that in. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just consistent yeah, with was, what we've been doing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right, uh, right. Yeah, that was, that was a tough spot. Um, okay, so then uh, my last item uh, it gets back to what Ben said at the beginning. So, you know, prior to the close of a public hearing and a few times over the course of our review, the applicant stated or implied that they would not change the project as designed and failed to answer requests for more information. They also failed to respond to the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program uh, request for more information uh, based on correspondence that Sam had with that office in which she read into uh, the meeting on the 7th of September. And Frank also reiterated at that meeting, just to clarify, making sure you heard everything. Um, as we also have just received quite a lot of information in the week or so leading up uh, prior to the November 2nd meeting, we were unable to engage with much of that information than the contents therein. Um, and so the questions that we wanted to ask about all of that, um, that we had started with, that we hadn't even gotten to yet, you know, they can't be answered. Um, so notwithstanding all the stuff that we just covered uh, already just now today, leaving that many topics on the table yet to be discussed, I mean, I might have denied the project just on that personally. Um, it doesn't feel like, uh, um, it just doesn't feel responsible to me, you know, as a commissioner to leave unanswered questions like that hanging out. So yeah, one more point. Um, and to Ben's point earlier, uh, Pete, why don't you go first? Sure. You know, I, I, I am disappointed uh, that this played out the way it played out at our last hearing. There was a lot of information to be discussed. And we, it was the first time that we had our consultant available to answer questions. And there was a, a, a lot of uh, uh, individuals with knowledge that could help in the discussion. But unfortunately, the question was called. Uh, we gently asked that not to happen and for the hearing, hearing not to be closed. But well, with that occurring, I think it put us into a position where we were looking for more information and for more answers. And uh, it, it, uh, it le left me unsettled uh, and with questions and concerns. Uh, so I also am uh, um, a very uh, uh, bothered by how it played out and, uh, and it, it, it creates a, uh, a quandrum to allow this to go forward, unfortunately, in my opinion. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, Daniel? Nothing really new. I, I mean, I think I asked uh, specific questions that I didn't really feel I had the answer provided. And, uh, you know, questions that uh, details were not provided that would have helped me come to a decision or where to condition the project. Okay, thanks, Dan. And Ben. Dan, do you have any specific questions that come to mind that we haven't covered here? Uh, no. Okay. no. I, I do have, I've gone back through all of the minutes um, just for the purpose of when this gets, you know, once the order of conditions is actually issued and the letter that will um, or the attachment that'll get sent to DEP for that purpose. I have, um, you know, highlights in the minutes and everything from previous hearings where information was asked for and either not provided or it was not provided in a way that really helped or provided right. any new information. Right, I believe Sam, you and I were talking about one example of that where uh, the information that was provided in response to a question was information that had been provided previously. And right. it was just the exact same letter. It was just right. resent separately. Yeah. Uh, a, a question was asked at one point in, in a hearing and the applicant had agreed to submit supplemental information and the information that was submitted was copies of sheets of the sheets within the 
site plans that the commission already had and a letter that the commission already had. Yeah. Um, so Ben, anything more in that vein on your mind? No, I think if Sam's made a list and um, we have that for reference, then um, obviously it's all, it's, that's from the record and so it's out there. Um, and I don't have anything else that I can specifically think of that was glaring in my mind. So glaring, sorry. Okay. Um, so, Ryan, um, well, yeah. I mean, I, I think an example that I might have is I've, I've asked, I asked uh, for more information about the plantings in the buffer zone. And to me, there, there's just not enough detail to determine what's what was uh, going on in terms of sort of mitigation for being so close to the wetland resource. You know, there was stuff shown, there was a planting list, but it really didn't, you know, there was no detail about how it was going to be maintained, at least that I, as I understood it. Maybe it was there, but um, I, I, I was left hanging on that count i would say mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i think that and that's one of those, I had, really i'd say that i had similar questions that i felt like never got answered on dan but maybe to the larger issue of if you know the you can work in the buffer zone but you have to show that you're not going to be impacting the resource area by taking away that much of the buffer and i think in the july or i think maybe sorry the early august meeting i i brought up the you know perspective that taking away almost the entire buffer zone to a BBW for that length was going to would harm the resource area and wanted more information about that. And I don't think we got any information specifically as to how it would not impact the resource area. Right. Right. Um, so that's my list that I had sort of um, ready for the moment. Does anybody else want to sort of cover a topic in particular, you know, whether it's the buffer zone planting a little more or, you know, anything else, you know, anything else in anybody's mind? Going once, twice. All right. Um, so with all that being said, then, um, we, we need to make a decision on whether to approve this uh, and condition it and write up the order of conditions or we need to decide to um, deny it. So um, it sounds like we are ready for a motion um, to see how we're gonna do. Anybody wanna make it? All no move. I, oh, sir. Pete, were you about to say it? I was. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, make a motion to deny this application. Okay. Second. I'll Anybody? amend that to um, read that we'll deny this application for failure to protect the interests and meet the performance standards of the Wetland Protection Act and, and uh, to provide information requested, failure to provide information requested by the commission. Thank you, Ben. Welcome, Pete. So then the motion as amended, um, let's do a roll call. Uh, Benjamin. Aye. Daniel. Aye. Peter. Yes. And I will also vote uh, yes. So um, there we go. That's all done.